Hi guys, welcome back to Manch Talk. Today is December uh, 1st, I believe it is. Today is Giving Tuesday, so if you're in a giving mood, please do go and support your most favorite nonprofits. My most favorite nonprofit is, of course, the Free State Project. Uh, everyone knows that that is a movement to attract libertarians and liberty lovers and freedom fighters to the state of New Hampshire to make sure we keep our awesome state awesome. So today I am delighted to welcome my guest, Jeremy Kaufman. He is a board member on the Free State Project. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks. It's great to be here. And you, you know, you stole my favorite charity. So maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll shout out the, the NHLA uh, yeah. as, as one of the big, uh, big reasons liberty is happening here in New Hampshire. That's a little, a little underappreciated. Yeah. So the NHLA, of course, is the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. And that is a organization that was started by Granite Staters probably like 12, 14 years ago at this stage. And what they really focus on is trying to make sure that we keep uh legislators you know accountable that we're looking at how they're voting uh certainly for myself my personal experience with lou d'alessandro was everyone's like he's a nice guy and then you tell him how he votes and people are generally horrified so the nhla of course uh rates legislators and they rate them according to how good they are on liberty so jeremy why is liberty important <laughs> <laughs> well uh i mean to, my answer is actually different from probably a lot of people's, right? Liberty is important because I value it, right? Liberty is my values. And I, I actually think that all people have the right to their values. And I think libertarians actually, one, a mistake that libertarians sometimes make is like, they think that, oh, like it is, we can just like, our positions are somehow correct, like objectively correct. And we're going to reason someone else into seeing that they're correct. I'm not actually so convinced that that's true. I think part of part of people who really support liberty, it's it's partially something that's in their values that is a little bit different from someone, you know, someone who is on the socialist communist side. Like they, their values are different, and that's fine. Um, but but you know, so we're not going to necessarily agree. And it's part of why I really like the Free State Project is it doesn't have to say that we're right. All it has to say it's like a sort of like smaller argument. Well, this is right for me, and we have we deserve. Uh, the right to live the way that we want to live um, um, somewhere. It's a large world, right? Uh, uh, you know, the fact that we're even doing it here in, in New Hampshire, I think is um, it's simply because it's the, the smallest, most reasonable way that we can uh, achieve it. Yeah, and that's certainly been my experience. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm obviously an immigrant. I grew up in South Africa. Um, you know, my, my values have always included this, this notion of freedom, this notion of individualism, right? Because that's really what it's about is my tagline for my Senate race was protecting the smallest minority, you. Yeah. And me, of course, right? And um, so you you moved out here when? Like, give us your little backstory. Like, who is Jeremy <laughs> and what are you about? Uh, sure. Uh, I have, um, I'm a nerd. Uh, I, have, <laughs> I have a background in, in physics and, and computer science. Uh, but I turned, uh, I've also been entrepreneurial uh, for, for most of my life. Started businesses uh, at a very, a very young age. Uh, I made, a, I made a, uh, my first business was actually a uh, uh, Playing video games. At oh, like, really? At, at fourteen, I had my own little web business and made uh, pretty pretty good money for a fourteen year old actually playing playing video games. So, uh, I always had a little entrepreneurial streak. Uh, I built a, a software as a service company. Uh, I bootstrapped that company. Um, I sold that company to um, to private equity a couple of years ago. I'm a father of three. That's a big big part of my uh, big part of my life. And uh, I also am the CEO currently of a company called uh, Library L B R Y. Um, uh, which is uh, a video platform that, that puts uh, publishers and, and uh, creators and viewers uh, back in control and puts power back in their hands instead of ceding it to, you know, to Mark Zuckerberg or YouTube. <laughs> so, of course, Library is uh, located right here in downtown Manchester. Uh, and then, of course, worldwide. That, that's your right. Team that's is right. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it's located. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have team members in, in uh in Nigeria, in Thailand, in Switzerland, and a bunch across America. Uh, it was used by 8 million people uh, last month to, wow. to, to watch a video, yeah. Wow, uh, so would it be fair to say something like library is an alternative to YouTube or to 
you know, anyone successor, who's a, successor, successor. Oh, there we, oh, I love that. And the idea is pretty much that, uh, and, and correct me, but I'm going to frame it this way for folks back home. You know, what we're seeing now is the advent of a totalitarian police state. And in order for you to suppress millions if not billions of people's rights worldwide, uh, you have to control information. And so what we have seen over the past uh, decade or so, I mean, I have to say, honestly, I was pretty shocked. For me personally, I always thought the Second Amendment would go before the First Amendment, right? And personally, I think the Second Amendment, your right to bear arms, in some ways protects your First Amendment right to free speech. And so I've been really surprised to see how fast free speech got killed. And part of that was because they did it on the campuses. We started this sort of mentality of of, oh, we are going to have free speech zones and we're going to only allow you to say these things. And so really what library, I believe, is trying to do is to say, no, you know, free speech is important. It's enshrined in our Constitution. We should have it. And so let's allow people to say what they want to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, so absolutely. So library, you know, li library basically does to publishing what Bitcoin did to money. It says it, it's basically uh, saying we can um, have uh, we, we can have um, end user ownership. You're the only one who who owns it. No one. You know, we as a company can't control your account, can't control you, can't take your identity away um, the way that that a company like uh, the, like YouTube would. Um, but in terms of that, and if, uh, and if you want to check it out, you can go to uh, OD, uh, the best app for it is called Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E dot -E com. Uh, and you can go check it out, watch videos uh, and all, all kinds of fun stuff on there. But, but let's talk about free speech because I think that's um, um, a very interesting subject. And the threats to free speech aren't threats in the legal sense. Like, I don't think there's been a violation of the, of the in a, you know, in a legal constitutional sense. I don't think the First Amendment is being violated. But as a, as a, in the cultural norm sense, right? sometimes when we talk about free speech, do we mean the cultural norm of like, do we, do we encourage debate? Do we encourage the... Um, we do uh, not uh, encourage uh, debate anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I, I came to sort of the ideas of liberty from, from the left. Unlike, unlike, it's probably a minority way for, for libertarians. I to, actually to did there. as well. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so like, I, if growing up in, in the 90s, and even into the early 2000s, I think free speech was more associated with the left. The threats to free speech were coming from conservatives. It was stuff like rap albums need to be censored, right? right. These can't be sold in stores. You know, these are, and and these were the kinds of threats that free speech faced. And they were those were actually constitutional threats, right? That, that um, to some extent, um, these threats are coming from institutions, and these institutions are primarily left, right? 95% of people who worked at who work at Google donated to Joe Biden, right? Um, wow, yeah, that's yeah. a high number. Right. Yeah. Eight, uh, Eighty to ninety percent of journalists. Oh, for right. sure. Yeah. Ninety plus percent of people employed at universities. Yep. Right. There is um, not an active conspiracy among these groups, but you have when when one set of uh, beliefs predominates, um, you end up getting uh, uh, group think. And 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 I think free speech is one of those things. It's like, well, you 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 use it. Uh, as a as a weapon when you're the the minority when you're losing then when you're the majority you suddenly don't care about it so much right we see this in politics all the time so uh, well that's interesting because i mean by by that logic one would say that you know the left is losing but if you look at these companies and the domination that they really have in the information market now that doesn't seem to be the case right yeah what's well, so the 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 the, the the sort of like anti-market socialist left, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily winning, but the sort the social left, the woke left in terms of the cultural values left, I think they absolutely are winning and their values dominate um, major tech companies, uh, m most media institutions, and uh, almost all universities. Yeah, no, that's true. So... Um what do you think, like, like, where is this going to end up? Because so, so let me backtrack for a hot, hot second. So I am starting to take a new position with regard to private companies or companies, right? So a very strong libertarian position has always been that the state's not allowed to tell us to do anything, but companies are allowed because of private property. You know, you as a restaurant or you as a company, you know, you can make your own rules. But in 
the era of COVID, this 2020 that has been thrown at us, I think it's fair to say that a lot of what we would classify in, in old school libertarianism as like uh, private companies are now acting as agents of the state. And I don't think we should so politely cede our rights to them anymore. I I think you should absolutely fight them uh, as if if the state should do anything against them. I would disagree very strongly about that idea. It takes when when companies become actively bad and, and especially an incredibly entrenched company, right? It took how many years for Facebook to achieve the dominance that it has. It took a, a decade, right? My, I had a Facebook account in um, in 2000 and gosh, 2003. I've had a Facebook account <laughs> For 17 years. Yeah, I've had a lot. Okay. Too. <laughs> um, I, I bet mine's I 2008. A, I was a freshman you probably college did student. In college, I was, yeah, yeah, I was a freshman <laughs> in college, and I was right, I was nearby in the Northeast, and and we were, and so it took like, so to think, um, like it, the mar- it, it it takes time for alternatives to develop in the market. The alternatives that do exist are growing right now. They're growing at really big rates, but even at really big rates, like I said, that libraries used by eight million people. Okay, YouTube is used by two billion people. Right. If even at even if we're doubling every three Mom. months, <laughs> or every month, doubling every month, you get there pretty quickly. Ex- exponential. Oh yeah. Okay. Do, but, 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 You're you better know, at math yeah. than I am. <laughs> but, uh, the point is, it takes time, and so we can't. We shouldn't be reaching for the um, you know the arm of this, the involuntary you know, forceful arm of the state uh, to solve something where there's free entry to this. Competitors exist. There, there are um, network effects that, that make it hard to leave. And what we can fight, what we should be fighting is things like the regulation that makes it, one of the ways the big tech is able to win that's unfair is um, financial controls, financial regulations. The fact that um, basically, like, like my, my uh, company deals in, in blockchain tokens. It's a core way of the, of the way that our service works. Um, and it is a nightmare. Uh, we're, so we're trying to compete on this front. This is how we're competing it. And the amount of regulation, I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year as a, as a startup company uh, trying to follow the, the, um, the government's rules. Uh, credit processing can basically be taken away from us. Um, and it's all regulation that, 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 that makes this kind of um, dominance possible. There's regulation that makes it difficult to build um, alternatives, right? Um, so these big tech companies use legislation called the Computer Fraud, the Anti Computer Fraud Anti Abuse Act, something like this, CFAA, and they hammer. Um, uh, um, I'll give an example. Uh, like um, uh, there's a, do you remember this site or ever see this site, Pad Mappers? Mm. Uh, it took Craigslist when Craigslist was bigger. Uh, uh, to Craigslist, I guess it's still pretty big for apartment listings. But when Craigslist was like at its peak, this site took Craigslist data and put it on and would map it. Right, uh, and so it's a, a better um, user experience. Um, like literally map it like for visual learning, yeah, yeah, just so like I could put it on see it, it yeah. and be like, oh, that vase I want is yeah. like down the street. Okay. Yeah, and it linked to the Craigslist uh, listings, you know, um, and Craigslist was able to use uh, to use this law to to kill the company. Um, I if I tried to build an alternative UI for Facebook, one that say even one that did something simple, like you can't. One of the things I think is weird. You can't get a chronological order of your friend's posts. Right? Right? And the reason, they don't want you to see it. They don't want you to know. Um, their algorithms and their choices say this is bad. You won't stay on the site as long if you look at this or you'll unfriend people because you'll see posts that we've hidden from you and we don't want you to see them, right. you know, this kind of thing. Um, Turns out all your friends are jerks, <laughs> Carla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and so, but they can sue me. They can use this law and say that you're, it's an unauthorized access, uh, you know, uh, and shut down uh, alternative clients and alternative things. So um, I, I would be solving these, like I would be trying to free the market up and, and not and not try to use government to, to solve this problem. Okay, and just to clarify, I wasn't actually arguing yeah, that yeah, we yeah. would use okay. government to, to solve this problem. I always, that, you know, that would to me would be the last resort. For me, it's more, um, and by way of example, in, in this COVID situation, right? Now that Governor Sununu has introduced a mask mandate, which I think is ludicrous. And in fact, I went to a uh, two 
functions last night. One was a Respect New Hampshire function that had small business owners talking about the harm they're experiencing as a result of the government's response to the virus. Not the virus, the government's response to the virus. Very important. The other one was a uh, Rebuild New Hampshire, which is a spinoff from Reopen New Hampshire. So they're sort of trying to pivot, right? So what we're trying to do is just to help people understand that, you know, these decisions that are made from on high are not costless. They're not, you know, the, uh, as well-intentioned as they are. Like one of the statements I recently heard was, you know, the laws of economics don't care, are unfazed by your uh, intentions, right? And so... One of the conversations there was uh, a lot of people from hospitality. And so they were saying, on the one hand, kind of saying, mm, we had hoped that masks would help people come out to help save our businesses. That's not really happening because I think the division has now happened. The people who are leaving their houses are leaving their houses and the people who aren't aren't right. But my position is, look, if this so, so what these hospitality folks were complaining about is they were saying, the state has now made us the mask police, right? So it's not your relationship with your customer. It's actually that, uh, you know, if, if someone does get up and go to the restroom and they haven't put a mask on and you let it slide because you're like, ah, that's a regular, it's fine, I think it's okay. And you have some, you know, Nancy Karen off taking a photo, writing to the AG, sending in the complaints. Now those people, you know, the, 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 the restaurant is getting fined, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, so the state has created the mass police as these people, as the agent of the state. And I'm like, so before I would be like, if you have a mask sign on the door, because I respect your property rights, I either won't go in, I'll try and work out an alternative or whatever, right? Um, now I'm just kind of like, no, yeah. <laughs> do what I want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and meanwhile, if you want to like, uh, you know, take over the all the city parks, it's completely okay. Right, right. It's, yes. It's, it's anarcho-tyranny. Right. It's uh, if you are if you are trying to be a good person, you get the full boot of the state on your face. If you're uh, you know, if you're being a complete ass, uh, as, as a complete jerk, um, <laughs> uh, you're you know, uh, it's OK. Uh, it's you know, it's it's ridiculous. Right. The, there's um, they're not they're not going after like you, know, you can go around. Um, you know, different neighborhoods. There's plenty of places where people, you know, aren't wearing masks and are, are, are breaking the rules, you know, but it's, they, they go after um, the people who are, you know, put in these really difficult positions who are trying to, uh, who, you know, who want to be good people and they're the ones, uh, you know, get, getting crushed. Yeah, it's it's very very strange times that we're living in. So tell tell us like, what, do you have like a top awful censorship story? Um, I mean, I'll tell you one brief one from me, and yeah. I think I've talked about it on the show before. But I watched a congressional hearing between Ted Cruz and some tech specialist, okay, yeah. who was a Hillary Clinton supporter who had voted for Hillary, who went in front of the Congress, a judicial congressional hearing, to testify that they thought in the 2016 election that Hillary had received between uh, about three million extra votes, right, which is what swung her to the popular vote. This guy, so Ted Cruz is all like, what? Like, uh, are you saying like, you know, it was three million because of the way that tech was using the algorithms to spread the information and stuff. And the guy actually said, uh, well, I feel comfortable testifying here for three million. Our data actually shows 12 million, but you know, I don't want to come here and make it a crazy number. Fine. So all of that happens. Congressional hearing on C-SPAN. That video clip was flagged as fake news on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I, look, it's it's completely absurd, and it relates to that phenomenon we talked about earlier, where the people enforcing these things are, they all have one set of views. There's not uh, ha, there's not differences, and so they get enforced in one way. Look, my honest opinion is that like I I don't think the election was stolen, but I think that debate should absolutely be had. And it, you know, we spent the last four years with every mainstream media institution advancing what was effectively a conspiracy theory around around Russia and stolen elections and how Trump got elected and that was just mainstream that was just totally okay uh, you know, oh their uh, conspiracy uh, theories are fine yeah. right they get to so we're at the stage where of course like the mainstream or the the 
the politically correct narrative, and you know, we should remind viewers back home that the term politically correct literally comes from Russia, where comrades would come together and they would say, well, that's not true. And someone else would say, yes, Yes, comrade, that is not true, but it is politically correct. <laughs> and that is where politically correct comes from. Yeah. It's like an untruth that people reiterate like masks or like any of the nonsense we're going through here where we have a virus that has a death rate of, you know, 0.4% maybe globally. And here we are just in this warped reality. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, people like you doing your doing your best to pierce that uh, pierce that bubble. And I think that that's that's great. Uh, you asked me what I think what was like uh, the most offensive. So I think there's a lot of offensive stuff. But as someone like I'm a scientist at my uh, core, I believe in the scientific method. I'm very into science. I run my business. It's like all settled, though, isn't yeah. it, Jeremy? Uh, <laughs> generally, <laughs> gen <that. laughs> generally, the more that someone says trust or believe the science, the more I, I expect them to be completely incompetent with regards to science. Uh, but the most offensive to me is like you have people who are credentialed, licensed, medical experts, professors at universities, uh, you know, um, former chief scientist at Pfizer, like people who are incredibly accomplished, people who are licensed by the federal government, right? These people who are supposed to try, right? The trusted experts and so on. And they are getting de-platformed. Their videos are getting taken down. Their videos are getting deleted. Um, most recently, uh, the most recent one was um, a very credible uh, scientific argument. It gets nuanced about testing cycles and, and these PCR tests and so on. And this guy was former chief scientist at Pfizer. Wow. Okay. Uh, um, and it's getting – Tom Woods' video. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, uh, that got taken down? Them. The cult of COVID? That the, one? Or? Uh, yes. 1.5 million vi views on YouTube. Wow. Uh, got taken down um, from YouTube. Right? I mean, the and like these are – smart people making good faith arguments and to say that like YouTube is going to be the arbiter of scientific truth, right? I'm not necessarily saying that the videos are correct. It doesn't matter it if they're correct. It doesn't matter and that's the point. Yeah. So are we at a stage where people can literally not think for themselves to such an extent that they can't discern stuff that, you know, nanny state has decided, oh, we'll yeah. just like feed you, spoon feed you some nonsense yeah. and you'll believe us, right? But I, I will say like this is some people like get down about all this stuff, I am a complete optimist here um, <laughs> because these facts are so raw. Like the pe people know, you can see it when CNN goes out in public and they're exposed to the average people and how average people react to them. Like people know and more and more people are waking up and the examples, when the examples are that jarring, like when we watched, you know, public health experts like oscillate, uh, you know, the danger of going outside based off whether it was, you know, Republicans or justice for George Floyd. Like, you can't be that blatant about it. Like, the people aren't, they're, I, they're not See, that but dumb. I, but, but, I mean, I'm hopeful, you know, I mean, I have a book called The Ecstatic Pessimist. So, I mean, I am a natural optimist, but I... I'm not so sure. I mean, I study propaganda, and I think we are we are losing the information war. We could sit here and we can do the human's work, but in the end, you know, like people, here's what people are going to remember. They're going to remember the headline from 10 days ago that said the vaccine is 94% safe. That is all people are going to remember. Later, we're going to find out it's maybe like 37% safe or something, but no one's going to remember that because they placed the anchor. They placed the propaganda anchor. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I think I'm, I'm not saying we're in a, in a, in a bright time here, but I think, um, I, I think the sort of grip and control of these institutions is weakening. I don't think it's growing stronger. I don't think COVID made it stronger. I think COVID for more and more people is like, is laying bare the extent of the problem. Right. And it is a big problem. Um, but I think I just don't, it's, I mean, just cause we also historically, we've seen it before around. Um, you know, effectively, you have people expressing false preferences, and this is what happens in totalitarian regimes. Some people call this current era an era of soft totalitarianism, where people are expressed like you know that some of the people in the universities that express these beliefs, you know, they don't actually believe them, right? At least some of them, uh, but they're forced so, to express right them. or yeah. self censorship. Yeah. We see a lot of that too, right? Where people start to choose yeah. not to really say what they believe because oh, everyone's going to hate it. Oh, trust me, I know. Like, I get yeah. a lot of hate, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I just think, I think historically, these these eras have never lasted over over time. 
and the more um, we have channels where we can, and especially with the internet, I don't, I do think the channels remain where we can communicate openly, and we can use uh, humor and uh, memes and direct, you know, direct uh, your short video clips and arguments. Like we can continue to spread those. They are, um, they are better because they are correct. Uh, and I think they will uh, They will ultimately win. Well, and also that sense of correct, right, is sort of the idea of, you know, truth. And I know there's this, like, postmodern idea of, you know, there is no objective truth. Yeah. I wish I, I hadn't I, said correct, actually. Yeah. You know, but, 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 you know, let's... They're, sure. they're, they're better for people because it's not about, it's actually right what the idea is it's actually not about them being correct they're correct in the sense that they're better for 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 more people and and this current era it's not it's not actually good for most people it's good for a small a uh, small group. So would you say for you that small group is sort of what we might call the uh, the cronyists? I like to call them the crapitalists, yeah. right? So it's a, it's a form of fascism, really, if we're going to break it down, right? So we have big state now, and we have big... Uh, Big tech, well, big everything, big pharma, big tech, big yeah. whatever, right? And these people are colluding to keep smart people like you who can only get eight million because they, as you mentioned, at the, you know, in the middle of the show, there are all these hoops you have to jump through that are barriers to entry for you to equally compete. So when we advocate for a free market, all we're saying is make it a level playing field. Don't let big tech shoot down the small little guy. Yeah, look, entrepreneurs always win though, right? That's the story <laughs> of the last several hundred years is it doesn't matter. Government and authoritarian rulers can be as awful as they want and entrepreneurs always win. Markets always win, right? I'm on the winning team. Uh, so like we, we um, will we'll route around the damage and poison that is the state to create things regardless. Um, and that uh, uh, optimistic uh, note, uh, <laughs> we are almost out of time. Uh, I do want to thank you so much for joining me. Maybe you can come back. You know, I'm going to start another show as well called The Art of Independence. I'm going to come up with some creative things, you know, have more guests and all of that. So I would love to have you back at some stage. Let people know where they can find out more about you or your projects. Uh, sure. You can follow me on Twitter. It's my full name, uh, Jeremy Kaufman. Uh, my personal domain, if you want to email me or other things, is kau. Uh, ffj.com and uh, check out uh, check out odyssey.com it's the best way to use library odyse.com well with that folks we are out of time remember if you are buying things for Christmas buy my book The Ecstatic Pessimist you can find that at carlagarrick.com or because Jeremy helped me out you can find it at theecstaticpessimist.com thanks so much guys take care and we'll see you next week